Oh, now I did wonder whether you had a vinyl copy. I'm really, really jealous of that. <laughs> Hi everybody, it's James here. Welcome to another video and another instalment of my series Revisiting, where I look back on one particular album from my uh, long musical life. And today I am delighted to welcome back to the channel for maybe the third time, is it? The fourth time? Fifth time? Third time, yeah. <laughs> third time. <laughs> uh, Mr. Ross Goodall. Hi, Ross. Hi, James. How are you doing? Yeah, very well, thank you. Very well. And uh, Ross and I today are going to be talking about this album, Off the Ground by Paul McCartney. Oh, now I did wonder whether you had a vinyl copy. <laughs> I'm really, really jealous of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I thought you might be. <laughs> Where did you pick that up, Ross? Online. It was an online oh. um eBay, possibly, maybe Discogs. When I was just getting into records, pretty much McCartney was the only artist I was collecting, you know, so uh -huh. I, I can't how much I paid for this, but well over fifty pounds, I think. You know, it's, it's probably shot up even since then. To be honest, you know, this this was this was this was many years ago. Um, but yeah, very lucky to have that. Yeah. Mm. So is that the nineteen ninety three original vinyl edition? As far as I know, that it was only ever one one, one issue of it, like from ninety three. Yeah, it's got a lo lovely gatefold. Oh, really nice God. artwork on this whole album. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. but and it's I think it's a Spanish pressing this. So yeah, it's um yeah quite right. a quite a hard to come by item these days. Yeah, I've never seen that record on vinyl. I mean, I bought the CD when it came out in '93, and uh, I have no memory of seeing the record in shops. Good stuff. All right then. Well, let's uh, let's get uh, let's get cracking on this on this topic. So um, usually when I do these installments of this series it's usually looking at a record that i always say has some special significance for me and i was wondering whether does this album actually fit the bill and i was thinking it probably does in a way one thing that i that struck me was that when flowers in the dirt came out which is 89 i was living with my mum and dad hadn't gone to uni yet living at home with my parents listening mainly to like wings and elo by the time this album came out which is the next one I'd done my entire university career, graduated, had moved to Leeds, signed on the dole, was burning the candle at both ends, was playing the drums in a band, listening to Teenage Fan Club, the Boo Radleys and dance music. It was like a completely different me. It's amazing mm -hmm. how much ground you can cover, <laughs> ground off the ground, uh, just in the three years or whatever it is from 89 to is it 93 yeah so a total sea change and I guess this album does bring back memories really of just my first year out of college just you know big huge friendship circle and you know listening to a lot of music that was around at the time a lot of um, contemporary stuff I suppose and this album came out and I didn't know anybody else at this point who liked Paul McCartney he seemed to be at this point um, commercially not in the greatest place he'd ever been in and in terms of his relevance maybe it, it was starting to burn out a little bit anyway I just thought I'd give you that little snapshot because I was kind of there at the time what about you how did how did this album slot into your discovery of McCartney quite early by the sound of it? I think it was quite early on, yeah, because I, like, I, when I first bought it, it was this CD of it I bought here, you know, so it was quite early on that I, I, that I discovered this album probably before a lot of Wings albums, to be fair, and I always thought that it was quite a consistently good album throughout yeah you know like there's no well 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 like at the time anyway i thought well there's no real duds on this album like there is with some other mccarty al albums where there's usually one or two stinkers you know with this album at the time i was like no every track's good but at the same time there wasn't anything which was like an essential mccarty track for me either i just thought like mm. it's, it's quite a good solid album and um, like throughout and it's always been one which i've i've, I've has kind of been a mid-table record for me it, it's, it's 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 not been it's not an album i hate by any stretch of the imagination but it's not one which i would put in say my top 10 mccarty albums i would be very doubtful that it would even make like the consideration for that so mm. yeah that's my kind of um history with that album i guess yeah this is the sequel to flowers in the dirt and i think it was it was perceived that way i'm going to make a really vague analogy here and it doesn't really it doesn't really work but i always think of flowers in the dirt as being a bit like band on the run and off the ground mm -hmm. being a bit like venus and mars um mm -hmm. it's not it's not perfect because i think flowers in the dirt is far more flawed than band on the run mm -hmm. and this album off the ground maybe is a bit more consistent than venus and mars but i think at the time though i think there was there was this perception that flowers in the dirt had been this quite impressive 
it was sort of pigeonholed as a, as a comeback album, wasn't it? Even though it wasn't really a comeback. It was certainly a comeback as far as Press to Play had been an absolute disaster as far as, you know, as far as the charts were concerned. Anyway, I think critically it got a few good notices, but Flowers in the Dirt, obviously it was him teaming up with Costello. There was a big hoo-ha about it. And I guess it also it coincided with his return to the live fray. Yeah. He'd not been touring for many years. He did this huge tour. Flowers in the Dirt was put together really by lots of different producers. And it was kind of, you know, one of McCartney's collage albums where he's working with God knows how many different people. And he mm -hmm. puts this very polished studio record together, I suppose. And then does the tour. The tour is a massive success. And he forms this band. And then he decides to do a follow up album in order to have something to plug on the next tour, which is the 93 mm -hmm. tour. So he goes into the studio and he makes a a um a band record which is not not really like the flowers in the dirt record it's the same musicians nearly the same musicians who we've been on tour with so we've got paul and linda obviously hamish stewart who'd been in the flowers in the dirt sessions so he was the bass player in the average white band originally fantastic musician great songwriter great vocalist We've got Robbie McIntosh, um, who I don't think had been on Flowers in the Dirt. I don't think he was on that album, was he? He, he might have done a couple of sessions, but he certainly wasn't hmm. r there right from the start. Like Hamish was definitely there before before Robbie came along, and, and I think so was Wicks as well, possibly. But he, he maybe just came in, came into the frame when he was putting the touring band together. I think, yeah. Yeah, so Robbie McIntosh, in case anybody doesn't know, he was he'd been the guitarist in one of the versions of the Pretenders back in the eighties. He was on um the third album, wasn't he? Learning to Crawl and the fourth album. I think he's on Get Close as well. And he'd been in the uh, in the Flowers touring band. Paul Wicks Wickens, who had been on Flowers and had done the tour, he's back on keyboards, piano and Hammond. The one change, the major change, you've got Blair Cunningham now replacing uh, Chris Whitson, who who'd moved to Dire Straits. So I always thought that was quite an interesting <laughs> move. He'd gone from Paul McCartney to Mark Knopfler. Not sure if that's rising up in the world or going down in the world at that point. I'm not entirely sure. But, that time, um, yeah. Yeah, even then, I It's interesting. The Dire Straits were on the way out as well, I suppose. Yeah, and Blair Cunningham had also been in The Pretenders, so I'm guessing that he, <laughs> he came in via Robbie. Just to cut a long story short, this record was put together quickly. It was recorded... Actually, no, it wasn't quickly. It was so again. Yeah. It it was recorded between September ninety one and June ninety two. So that actually, mm -hmm. the recording sessions were quite prolonged. And it's interesting because when you read about the history of the record, it says McCartney wanted to record the album live in the studio, meaning the mm -hmm. band would rehearse an entire song and then record it in one take. So, given that they were doing that, I'm not quite sure why it took from September '91 to June '92. Yeah, um, that's well, just... it's interesting. I think that was obviously the the initial idea was a quick and dirty kind of band album. You know, notably the first time he probably done that since the last Wings album, Back to the Egg, was the mm. last time he'd, he'd worked with a kind of set set lineup like of musicians, and that was hardly a oh, hardly like a roaring success either. <laughs> has to be said, um, but like, yeah. but. Um, but yeah, so it, it. But it seems like this album probably, like when you hear it, bits of it feel okay. This is quite bits of it feel like quite spontaneous. But then there's other moments which are, are you've got like common people with the big orchestration on it. Mistress and Maid, I think, has a kind of like a fancy arrangement on it as well. So they obviously, I think that was a starting point. But then they obviously started to put different bits onto it. But I also think that McCartney at this time was was doing a lot of extracurricular like activities as well things like his classical stuff like Liverpool like Oratorio I think he was working on it on like around this time and the Beatles anthology had started filming as well so he was quite busy so I think maybe mm. that was probably what prolonged these sessions more than anything else the fact that he was just so busy doing doing so many other different projects around this time. What I find interesting in terms of the critical reputation of this record so hang on a minute so I'll just say <laughs> I'll just say to me this album is one of those classic kind of um, you have to you have to be into McCartney to know about this album, to enjoy this album. Would mm -hmm. you agree with that? It's kind of like a deep entry. In the yeah, category. it's quite a deep. And yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, the fact that I think that like there wasn't really any really notable hit singles, at least in like the UK and especially again, like America. Um, like sort of like I, I know like hope, I'm probably get object like Hope of Deliverance was uh, I think his last top twenty hit I think in like the UK but it did nothing like in like America so I think that's possibly why it also just it, it definitely feels like a lesser album certainly when compared to Flowers but also the one after this Flaming Pie feels mm. like a kind of much more of a kind of um, complete sort of album like you know like um, 
like the this which I guess on the surface can feel a little bit um like sort of lacking, I guess, in mm. in something. Yeah, talking about the single, I've got a very clear memory of seeing the video for Hope of Deliverance playing in my local pub, the Hyde Park pub. Oh, there we go. Very nice. I got the C D single. Yeah. Um yeah. Yeah, I used to drink in this pub called the Hyde Park that had a video jukebox, and uh, you know most of the music in there at that time, '93, was all it was all it was you know it was Nirvana, it was the Seattle scene. I mean, you had REM, they were huge, they were always on that jukebox, and I used to put Hope of Deliverance on in the pub, you know, and he used to come on, I used to be hooray, you know, Paul McCartney. But like I said before, there was there was a definite sense, and I could tell from talking to my friends, you know, people would say to me, "Oh right, you're into Paul McCartney then?" <laughs> okay, <laughs> it almost felt a little bit like you know being into Shawdy. Waddy in 1985 or something it was just like uh, okay there was a definite sense of that because it was pre-anthology and mm -hmm. um yeah the Beatles again just didn't seem to have a huge amount of currency at this point um yeah which is interesting coming after like I mean because of course like the narrative now is that he did like the big flowers of the dirt world so it kind of rehabilitated his kind of critical reputation and then it was kind of then and then the anthology was the next step. But then there was this album, like if, if you say that he was still being kind of written off, off even after that hugely successful tour, like as being just irrelevant and a bit of like old, uh, like sort of like old money kind of thing. It's, it's quite interesting, yeah, that it would take the anthology and kind of Britpop for the Beatles to become kind of cool and relevant again. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I guess, I mean, we can start talking about the songs now. It probably is just because there are no songs on this record, really, that are, that are going to, um, you know, knock the socks off anybody who is not a McCartney fan or who doesn't, who's yeah. not that interested in McCartney. Um, just before we start talking about the individual tracks, what is your opinion of the production on this record? Because I listened to it again last night for the first time in a long time, the CD. It's quite funny, I don't listen to CDs very much now because of the vinyl. And I put the CD on. I really, really enjoyed the CD. <laughs> Just the, finally hearing music without any sort of annoying crackle or anything like that going on. And the sound to me, it actually sounded like this is actually, this sounds really good, this album. It sort of took me by surprise. I was expecting it to be, I don't know, maybe a bit dated, maybe just not very impressive but actually production wise to me it sounds actually it sounds really nice yeah yeah like i'd agree there i think it's um it's it's, it's not a fussy production really you know i think it's, it's very clean very um it serves the songs quite well like you know and and, and i'd like to say it hasn't really dated you. you could almost imagine this album coming out say a couple of years back, like, you know, it doesn't sound 90s, it doesn't sound 80s, it, it does have a kind of timeless quality to it, but I suppose it, it also is a bit of a, it, you could maybe say it's a bit bland, I don't know, maybe lacks a bit of like an identity, um, but it's, but I mean, yeah, yeah, it's fine, Doctor, I guess nothing, nothing to write home about, but I think, um, yeah, it, yeah, just sounds what it sounds like. Yeah, there's lots of really beautiful, sort of keyboard production, a lot of really nice backing vocals as well. You know, really lovely arrangements. You think mm -hmm. of those albums like Tug of War is a great example of a McCartney backing vocal album. Ram is another one with Lindy. Yeah. I really enjoyed hearing Linda on this mm -hmm. record. I never really clocked her before, but she's in there and she sounds really good. It's like you know, from the Wings days when she was maybe a little bit, you know, still learning the ropes, still maybe a little bit yeah. out of tune. On this record, she really sounds like top notch you know really mm -hmm. really great great sound to her voice let's get into the tracks then so the album kicks off with this song off the ground and mm -hmm. i guess we have to compare it straight away to the opening track of flowers in the dirt which was this absolute jewel you know my brave face the costello co-write i'm gonna guess that you're with me on this one that this is this is not really up there with that is it there's a kind of disparity having said that i don't dislike it yeah, yeah, like I'm with you there. I think yes, it's, it's, it's certainly no my brave face. Yeah, that 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 is a McCartney classic for me, and I think should should be more acclaimed like that. It is. This track is a good, decent opening song for me. I I like the sound of this. You know, like it's quite heavy sound. You know, like the kind of guitar sound. There's a bit of distortion. There's a bit of grit to it, which I quite like. And then some nice lyrics on it as well. The chorus is a bit silly, but there's a good line like that takes a pot of knowledge to make a big tree grow it um for the cedars I like like that line I can't, I can't remember it but that line is is great like like quite like quite philosophical and good music video it's quite it's very interesting that this is one which was actually not doesn't actually feature the band on it this was actually just paul and paul and wicks wickens like a keyboard player basically built up this track themselves so right. it's quite quite interesting yeah that it wasn't that it wasn't really a kind of it kind of almost sits outside like off the album again like that regard but no it's a good song which i've always enjoyed yeah mm. 
I didn't know that. I always assumed that it was a full band performance because it does sound like a full band, doesn't it? It's got a very full soundstage mm-hmm. type of thing. I love all the hand claps. In fact, there's a few yeah. tracks on this album with a lot of hand claps going on. He must have been in yeah. a bit of a hand clappy mood. Interesting that you mentioned the guitar on this song and the next one, Looking for Changes. I was quite excited when I heard this because at the time I was listening a lot to the album Ragged Glory by Neil Young, which had come right. out in 91. And that album has a very... Is a really great guitar sound, a really kind of, you know, one of Neil's greatest guitar albums, very just crunchy and noisy with all that feedback. And when I heard the first two tracks on this record, I thought, oh, fantastic. Paul's going to rock out and, you know, be. And then it's just the usual thing with McCartney. It's that classic back to the egg thing, isn't it? Where you sort of think, oh, great. You know, he's got a bit of energy and it's going to be a bit rocky. And then as as the album goes on, you sort of realise, oh, yeah, but there's also going to be a lot of piano ballads and it's all going to get a bit, you know, syrupy. He, he always does that, doesn't he? He always kind of. You know, his albums tend to, they they start off and then you think, OK, and then they start to sort of... And then they go in different directions. Yeah, they kind of like dart around quite a lot. Yeah, which is sometimes <laughs> like what I quite like, because like more yeah, yeah. complaint albums in general or sometimes can be or they just get a bit samey by the second side but that rare, rarely happens like with McCartney's albums I feel um, yeah. probably because I'm quite biased but also po- possibly because you know he does dart around from ballad to kind of rocker to something else a bit more experimental as well so yeah it's it's quite yeah mm. quite a versatile album yeah so then we get into Looking for Changes, which is another rocker. And I think musically, this actually is quite a nice track. I guess mm. the lyrics are very, uh, you know, well, for him, they're very political. You know, it's, it's a song about animal rights, um, maybe a bit clunky in the way some of the verses come across. I don't know. I mean, mm. it's it, it's good. But I think um, for a song like this, if you're going to do an angry song about animal testing, it needs to sound angry. And the problem I've got with this song is it doesn't really sound angry. It sounds like a kind of a couple of hippies in their 40s, you know, trying to do a bit of a protest song about animal animal testing. It, it doesn't seem to have a huge amount of conviction to it. I don't know what you think. Interesting. I actually disagree with that. I, I think this is okay. a song that's really grown on me, actually. And I think it, um, you can really, well, certainly for me anyway, with this song, you can really hear McCartney's passion about the subject. I do think some of the s- s- lyrics he perhaps, yeah, maybe a bit clunkily written, but I think, you know, it's, it's obvious that, I mean, the, the, this whole album, this whole era was probably McCartney in his most. Um, overtly kind of activist kind of campaigner kind of mode because he was associating himself with a lot of different causes Greenpeace and the animal rights or mm. PETA kind of stuff like that like around this time I think I can hear his passion and he does he, to me he does sound angry where he like that line about um the bastard laugh, laughed his head off and that mm. kind of stuff like that you know he can see sound well to me anyway I can feel his um anger at what he's kind of singing about like animal testing so yeah no uh, it's, it's a song which I know does come in for a lot of stick and people say it's it's a bit it's a, it, it, it doesn't sound convincing but to me it always has so maybe I'm maybe I'm I'm in the minority there I think possibly I think there was a definite sense of surprise at the time at that lyric you know the bastard left his head off and then the, uh, there was the b-side as well wasn't there big big boys bickering where he yeah he sings the line uh fucking it up mm-hmm. for everyone i think you're right yeah. i think he was definitely not mincing his words at this point and it's i think it was ab- admirable that he was actually you know going for it in a bit of a john lennon-y kind of way well, exactly he... yeah and, and even then like the tool like what he did like the like, kind of like the pre-show film basically had all this kind of footage off kind of animals being tested and kind of mm-hmm. slaughtered for kind of meat and stuff so he's very much like no like sort of like not holding back at all really like mm-hmm. around like this time um, like like that sort of approach probably um which is kind of definitely um calmed down a little bit like that possibly since like since linda's been gone possibly you know well, i wonder how if, if she was maybe quite a big mm-hmm. influence on all kind of songs like this you know actually in- encouraging him maybe to go the extra mile a little bit with these kind of songs now the third track hope of deliverance to me this this is my favorite song on the album to me it's just a classic mccartney single Maybe mm-hmm. if you were to sort of try and bracket it, it would be at the bottom end, you know, at the lower end of the McCartney classic single hierarchy. Mm-hmm. It's not sort of up there with your, you know, No More Lonely Nights and your silly love songs, but it's definitely, it's definitely, you know, in the ballpark. It's got a lovely tune, a lovely arrangement. Mm-hmm. I love the, what is the instrument that's on it? It's a kind of, um, some sort of guitar, it's, isn't it? It's like a harp. I think Linda plays it. I mean, you see them do it live. I mean, she's got some. She's she's got a kind of like a big. I don't know if she like she strums it or something. It just gives it a kind of very kind of sparkly kind of sound in in places. It's yeah, it's a nice arrangement on it. 
Yeah, it says auto harp here next to Linda's auto name. Harp. So yeah. Auto yeah. harp, right? Yeah, and harmonium as well. And um, yeah, I just think it's a lovely song. I think it's definitely a bit of a sleeper in the catalogue, a bit of a hidden gem. Casual <laughs> fans won't remember it. I mean, it, it, it flopped as a single pretty much, didn't it? So. Well, yeah. yeah, well, no, it's interesting because it's like one of these songs which it's in certain parts of the world, it is among McCartney's bigger hits. Like, like, like South America, it's quite a big hit. And in Germany as well, mm. it's, it got to number three. Are you a fan of Hope of Deliverance? Well, I mean, I was going to say, it's not one of my favourites on the album, but I've got all three versions of it like as a single, so I must <laughs> like it to some extent. No, it, it, it's, it's, it, it, it's a pleasant song. If I was, it, it, I definitely think it deserves a place on any McCartney Hits compilation, simply because it was it was a top 20 hit, and it, and it is a good song. Certainly not my favourite like on the album. It's not one I necessarily go to. But no, it's a good track, and, and yeah, definitely worthy like, of its place. Good stuff. Okay, well, now we're going to get on to first of two Costello co-writes. So we should have mentioned before uh, that McCartney had been writing with Costello and they'd they produced a batch of material a couple of years before, a few years before, hadn't they? Costello had used some of it on his uh, record and then McCartney obviously did, a was it three songs on Flowers in the Dirt? Three or four tracks on there? Yeah. yeah. And on this record, we've got Mistress and Maid, and then later on, we've got The Lovers That Never Were. Mistress and Maid is this quite interesting song. It's, it's, it's quite squeeze-like, I always think. It's sort of, it sounds like something that Chris Difford could have come up with. It's got a waltz feel as well, hasn't it? Which yeah. always, always makes me think of a song like uh, Tough Love on Babylon and On, that kind of waltz. And it tells this third uh, person story about, um, about a guy and his mistress, I suppose. I think it's quite, it's quite a nice song. I don't think it's... To me, it's it doesn't really rival, say, that day is done on Flowers in the mm. Dirt. It's maybe a bit more of a kind of minor, a minor song, but it's it's you know it's a nice one. I, I again, I, I maybe slightly disagree there. I, I think this is one of the best, the better McCartney Costello co-writes. <laughs> well, I say more well, like the best. I mean, like they're all they're all most of them are, are great. This is definitely among the top of the pile for me. You know, I think. Um, just for me, unfortunately, I mean, with this album version, and it's with both the Costello um, co-writes on here, I don't think that they're... I don't think that... I think they're a bit overproduced, mm. like, the two Costello co- co-writes on here. Like, there's a, like they do a live version, like, of McCart- like McCartney, like, McCartney, like, and Costello, I think from 1995, not sure, like, if you've heard it, just both of them, like, on, like, acoustics. Mm. That sounds brilliant, you know, it's just stripped back, and you can really... The song really shines through that. Mm. I don't think Costello was too enamoured, was he, with any of the any of the production jobs that McCartney did on their songs. I know he didn't like what um, he'd done to That Day Is Done, and we know, you know, Don't Be Careless Love was 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 messed up, really. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I think they changed the song. Yeah, so it's... yeah, I don't really know what happened with these with these Costello songs. It was almost like McCartney didn't quite have enough faith in them as songs. I always think he didn't quite realise that when you write with somebody like Costello, it's probably mm-hmm. best to adopt more of a Costello approach to the production and yeah. the arrangement. Keep them simple, keep them raw. Let the lyric come across, let the tune come across, rather than being, you know, trying to bury them in too much production. So I would definitely agree with you there. Yeah, yeah. Now, I mean, like, I, I guess while we're on the Costello song, I mean, we could talk about like lovers that never were now. I mean, yes, yes, I can do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, for me, that one is again, it's a like, because like, this is the first time I heard it was was on this album. I'd have got brilliant song, fantastic lyrics. McCartney sings it well, all all fine and dandy. But then I heard the demos of it on the Flowers in the Dirt box set, and it's specifically there's an in studio demo which I think he maybe did with Jeff Emmerich around. It must have, must have been about Flies of the Dirt time. And, and I would say that that is probably his best solo vocal performance. Certainly rivals the pound is sinking, like, you know, like like, like, like that. So you definitely need to hear that. It's like, I think it's like the 1988 demo of it. And it's brilliant. And it's in a different time signature. It's in 3-4 time. So it feels a lot more Costello-y and, and it feels a lot more serious and i guess actually giving the song the respect i guess like that it deserves okay so those are the two costello tracks just as a little um aside it's just occurred to me looking at the track list that mccartney had done some co-writing for this record hadn't he with hamish stewart there were a few quite good songs <laughs> kicking around with hamish but i don't think any of them got on the record did they i don't think he put any None of them got on the album no so there was one called uh keep coming back to love which was a b-side i think it was a b-side to Come on, people! Yes, Plus, I'm not got any other CD single. Uh, sing uh, any of the other CD singles. That is a brilliant song, and it, it should have been on the album. Fantastic track. And then there was another track they co-wrote called "Is It Raining in London," which was a TV doc 
documentary made uh, made for this album called Moving On, and that song features quite heavily in it. Yeah, you know, like well, like like I thought, like recording the string arrangement. I think he got um, it was either Carl Davis who did the Liverpool Auditorio or some other arranger do this gorgeous string arrangement on it. But that song has never seen the light of day. The only recording of it is a live version by Hamish Stewart, and it sounds gorgeous it it, mm. it it sounds beautiful and it's just yeah it's, it's just a shame that neither of those tracks made it onto the album because i think both of them are a mm. damn sight better than some of the material that he um, selected for the album okay so let's uh flip back now back to side one again um so we've got the song i owe it all to you which um this is one of those songs i sort of see it really as one of those Ballads to Linda, really, a long tradition of these songs where he just basically sings his heart out to her. And then there's a kind of synth line, I think, which reminds me a bit of Strawberry Fields Forever. If you listen to the synth part, the opening line, it's very, very similar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think there's a bit of a 60s vibe going on with this one. The lyrics, to me, they sound a little bit, I suppose you'd stereotype them as hippy-dippy again, a little bit sort of grooving middle-aged hippies maybe on the uh on the continental trail of, of just you know various hip and happening tourist attractions and he's just basically singing of his uh you know his love for linda against the backdrop of these various exotic um places yeah, that's a glass cathedral i think and i looked into the golden canyon lines like that yeah which are quite they're quite nice when, when like, they're on like the record teams about the music yeah it's yeah I yeah. I think it's a lovely track, this. I've always liked it. It's very um, straightforward. Um, I mean, there's no there's no depth to the lyric. It's not like Maybe I'm Amazed, where you get a sense of, um, you know, he's, he's declaring his love for Linda against the backdrop of some kind of churning emotional um, upheaval. It, it's just purely, yeah, I'm having a great time. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm loving it. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> But musically, I think it's one of the most attractive songs on the record, really. Lovely vocal arrangements, beautiful keyboard arrangements, mm -hmm. quite sort of 60s-ish. Yeah, no, I like this song as well. My only complaint with it, and it's a complaint which I've probably shared with quite a few of the tracks on this album, maybe maybe, like, well, well, maybe like one or two others, is it just goes on a bit too long. So we hit Biker Like an Icon, and it's going to be interesting to get your views on this one. <laughs> when I listen to it, I never really, I can never really fault it. I think the actual line, Biker Like an Icon, I think is quite clever. It's It's got a bit of a ring to it. And the actual song itself is in that grand tradition of McCartney narrative story songs, a bit like She's Leaving Home. You know, it tells a proper little story. It's not just a meaningless lyric musically i think the band turn in a good performance mm -hmm. my one criticism would be uh he just sings the biker like an icon thing too many times so that i think that's mm -hmm. why it gets it just gets a bit tiresome the song seems to repeat itself if he kept that back and maybe he only used it twice in the song maybe it would have been better but in general i i can't really fault this song or say it's a terrible song i know some people really just can't stand it, but I, I've never really seen the problem with it. This is probably the track which, when most people are thinking about this album, would be oh, it's back like an icon. I don't like that song. I mean, it's a song that I'm not minded, but I, I I wouldn't ever pick it out and play it, you know, out with the album personally. But like you say, when it's actually on, there's not really a lot you can really fault with it. I mean, I guess some of the lyrics are a little bit. Um, silly like kind of like the first line there was a girl who loved a biker but the biker didn't like her basically because that it's a bit silly isn't it you know a little bit like not like not a lot of depth um like no. to it but um but it but this was one that this was apparently the first track that they recorded for the album like this like this was from the first sessions in in december 91 and it just came together really really quickly i think they recorded mm. it in like next to no time maybe, maybe like about like a day I was saying before how I didn't think there were any really good bits of McCartney vocal on this record, but if I had to pick one, I would say mm. on this on this track when he sings the high verse, his voice actually yeah. does does carry quite a punch. Um, it wasn't an ambition anyway. That line, yeah, mm. yeah, I'm quite good on that. Yeah, yeah, and again, good band. Like I said, I I'm glad it's this band on this track rather than the band he's got at the moment because mm. I do think. They do a good job of it. And then we get to Peace in the Neighbourhood, which I suppose is the other song which people might kind of pull a face at, because this is this is the real sort of hippy dippy one, isn't it? It was a time when things were good. It was Peace in the Neighbourhood. It, it's very, I suppose it's very banal, isn't it? I mean, it, he's, he's, he's trying to carry on this peace and love thing from the 60s into the 90s. Yeah. So he, he's not really finding a way of doing it, which is going to reach out to anybody who knows 
you know, who knows nothing about McCartney, nothing about the Beatles. It's just a Paul McCartney song for Paul McCartney and Beatle fans, written on autopilot. Sounds really nice, wonderful bass playing on it, wonderful bass sound on it. The band turns in a good performance, but it doesn't really go anywhere, does it? Yeah, it's again. This is a, this this is the other kind of. I I I guess it's this it's this mid album slump. This kind of record has. I think these two tracks are definitely the weakest moments on the record. This one in particular, I think, again, like you, the lyrics. I mean, that when I was maybe thirteen, they were maybe okay, but you can just look at them now and think, oh, that's a bit. It's a bit right that isn't it like best thing i ever saw was a man who loved his wife and yeah they're just just a bit it's this kind of idealistic kind of vision of that which i suppose i mean it kind of fits in with kind of what he was his old kind of activism thing what was going on around this kind of time and that you know like all his environmental stuff so it kind of fits in with that a little bit but yeah it's never been a favorite personally and again a bit like it suffers a bit like i owe you just goes good just because i'm far too long i think it's it actually clocks in about six minutes i suppose if we could just we could come out of sequence now again a little bit and just quickly dispose of get out of my way because i mean mm. it falls into the same category really doesn't it it's just a kind of tossed off rocker yeah. um again when you listen to it i can't fault it in any way it's it's mm. a good, it's, it, it's a good band performance it's got some very yeah. chuck, chuck berry style guitar from robbie mcintosh and does actually yeah. sh you know really showcase what a good guitarist he was but it couldn't be more generic really again like a lot of these chats it goes on too long that it has, it has this really annoying false ending this chat just when you think uh, it's got all these blaring horns on it and then just you think oh thank god that's over and then it kicks in again like, oh, <laughs> god, not another minute of this so let's bracket the two ballads now on side two um we've got golden earth girl and wine dark open sea mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um i think both of which are musically very very nice to listen to um golden earth girl the lyrics do slightly make me cringe a little bit i don't know why um some of the images know. Some of the yeah. images are a bit pukey, I always think, a little bit like, Ugh. but musically, it's really, really lovely. It's one of those really mm. nice McCartney melodies, would you say? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, yeah, no, I, no, no, like I, no, like I like really like Golden Earth Girls. It's a song I often forget about being like on the album, but I always enjoy when it's on. I, I guess the only thing would be is this is probably one of the first examples where he does sound a bit old on on records, you know, like is there like, like the first verse especially, he's singing it quite high up in his register and even say maybe about five years previous, he'd be able to pull it off, I think. But on this track, he, he, he does sound a little bit on the croaky side, but I do like the song. I, I like the lyrics for the most part, but again, it doesn't feel, it feels very much like it was a very polished kind of George Martin-esque kind of studio production. I think it's got an arrangement on it. It's credited, um, it's uh, um, arranged by Paul McCartney and Carl Davis. Um, it says a gone by at the back. So it's got a full arrangement on it. It's not a raw, I'm just going to do this on the piano myself and we'll just do a little, a little simple arrangement. You know, it's a full production, but I think it's all the better for it because I think it, um, I think I think it's a really lovely song. And then Wine Dark Open Sea, again, is a lovely song. I do think it goes on too long. He turns in quite an understated vocal performance on this song. It's another piano ballad. I do like the lyrics of this one. They're very straightforward, very simple. But then it sort of reprises at the end and you get this sort of long outro with him emoting and doing all that throat tearing stuff. And I think I think it should have been a shorter song. Yeah, I'm with you there. But it is pop, it is one of my favourites on the album. It's, my top, it's in my top three songs for the album just because I love the I mean the guitar work on it's really excellent. You know, you've got a nice interaction between I think there's an acoustic on it and then there's some electric work and assumed done by Robbie and it's just beautiful. And then a great vocal from Paul. Simple lyrics like you say, but quite direct as well, like you know, and, and, and nice images on it as well. You know, you can really imagine they're just just being yeah sailing alone at night, you know, like listening to this track. It, it's lovely. It it really mm. is nice. But um, again, a, a bit long. Interesting fact about this song, though, was when that Pure McCartney compilation came out a couple of years back. This was the only track from Off the Ground what made it onto that. Like, that was compiled by Paul himself. So Open Deliverance wasn't even on that. It was a four LP greatest hits kind of set, you know, of his best material. I hope it was not on there. Not the other singles, but Wind Up Open Sea Walls. So it's maybe a song like he's got a personal affection for. And then Come On People, I had to laugh last night because <laughs> I listened to it and I couldn't stop. I got goosebumps in the chorus. And I, I think of Common People as being this quite sort of ploddy, slightly tiresome song, sort of, you know, suppose a loft kind of thing, a bit forced, a kind of forced attempt to do a kind of hey jude big 60s thing mm -hmm. and he puts he puts the cosmically conscious thing on the end almost like nod to the beatles the 68 beatles and whatever 
and uh, but last night I listened to it. It came into the chorus. I could hear Linda going, "Oh, oh yeah, oh yeah," and I just yeah. felt the hairs on the back of my neck standing on end. I was like, "Oh wow, I've actually had an emotional reaction to come on people. I must like it after all." You know, it's there's nothing wrong with it. Again, it's it's just it's it is what it is. You know, if you were to say, "Write me a." A Paul McCartney and a piano based anthem in the style of Hey Jews about humanity, people coming together that you know it probably would end up like <laughs> like a bit like common people. Yeah, it, 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 it's a song which I guess it on it's always fallen a little bit flat for me, mm. but I think um, I, what I probably like more about it was actually the music video. It's got an excellent music video directed by Kevin Godley. Yes, that's um, right. This great, this great um, scenes where McCartney's playing this kind of old kind of piano and then there's kind of these people sort of mm. working kind of super fast time to kind of fix it and that. And it's an excellent, it's an excellent video clip and that's me and that's how I first heard the song was through the video, like the McCartney is DVD. So mm. I've maybe always had it, I've always associated it with like the music video for it, me. It's the obvious choice to finish the album. It couldn't have finished with anything else to be honest with you. Paul's yeah. last ever appearance on Top of the Pops was with this song as well in, in 93. Um, right, um, okay. I'm not sure why he appeared because it only got to number 41 like in the charts but yeah there's a top of the pops performance off and then all these people looking slightly baffled around and like who's this? this who's this guy yeah <laughs> who's this? yeah yeah i always hate all those appearances that i see them i just think it looking at the people all gathered around him thinking yeah you've got no idea who he even is you know what an incredible yeah. moment in your life you're having there without even knowing it like i said i i did enjoy it last night but objectively i look mm -hmm. at it and i think yeah it is generic i guess that is a word that you could actually, um, which we have actually aimed at a few songs on this record, mm. that sense of generic. Maybe in his mind, he was thinking in terms of, uh, you know, an album that he could quickly record, some songs that could be done live easily without too yeah. much messing about. And what he ended yeah. up with was something a little bit McCartney by numbers, I guess. He comes out of this, goes into the anthology, and then from the anthology, he then goes out and does Flaming Pie. And I think that was... Mm. A, an attempt to do something um well he he said at the time something more beatlesy didn't he and try to make mm. try to make records a bit more like the old days but strangely enough this album maybe is is more in that spirit in the sense that it you know they 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 tried to knock out the tracks quickly with a live band kind of touched on a couple like off the kind of b-sides of that but there's a kind of like a lot of people do say oh this album would have been brilliant if he just mm. put all the b-sides on it instead of the album but i do always think with some because i was listening to all the b-sides this morning and while they are a lot of them really great songs are genuine hidden gems like in like his catalog i mean it's the first time i heard a song like sweet sweet memories was um, like, a couple of weeks ago fantastic song very beatlesy always heard a bit of xtc in that track you know like kind of like it has a kind of andy potter trying to do the beatles kind of thing like on it you know it's, it's a great song but then i always think well if they were on the album and things like I Owe It All To You and even, say, Peace In The Neighbourhood and Golden Earth Girl had been B-sides, would they have gone down as the hidden gems, like, you know, like the real <laughs> kind of like... Because because they are still good songs, you know, like at like the end yeah, of the day. Yeah. I think it's I think it's just quite interesting how he had so many... Mm. How he'd amassed so much material at this time and yet almost still felt the need to go back to those Costello songs and kind of um, sort of... Um, I don't say murder them because he doesn't be any means, but kind of like overwork them a little bit and kind of return to that it's it's, 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 it's just a little bit odd all right well viewers thanks for watching thanks for being with us for this one let us know what you think of off the ground do share your thoughts uh so for now i shall take uh, my leave of yourselves and of ross thanks ross for being with me no worries james thanks again for having me on no worries and we'll see you all soon take care bye